So let me actually begin by uh, making a claim that we are in the middle of a shift to a very important transformation in the world of computing, and that for over 3,000 years, we have been building machines that are effectively calculators. And you know whether we were talking about the abacus or the very machines that you carry in your pockets or the PC, fundamentally, that's been the basic function that we've implemented more and more effectively um, to be able to process algorithmic functions efficiently. The development of programmable systems, of course, have greatly enhanced the versatility. But the moment and the shift that we're encountering right now is this transition that, for the first time, we're starting to build learning systems. And that is very, very fundamental. So I want to do two things. I want to be able to motivate and provide some evidence on what is happening uh, and why learning systems are happening right now. And two, I want to talk about what professions will be like in the context of partnering with these learning systems in the context of expertise. So my first claim is that no institution and no individual will be able to ignore this learning systems trend. And let me uh, provide this motivation. First, that something fundamental is going on in terms of the quality and accuracy of the ability of our machines to learn. And I'm going to narrow that a bit, and I'm going to give you a perspective of what is driving a major breakthrough, which is doing pattern recognition. So if you want to be able to decipher what areas are going to be most impacted in the near and midterm, think of the world and classes as problems as pattern recognition. So if you look at driving and you say, can driving be mapped into a pattern recognition problem? If the answer when you do that analysis is yes, that's a pattern recognition problem, it will be impacted. So I'll give you sort of that shorthand for looking at the world how many computer scientists and technologies would do. And what it's showing here is that, for example, if you look at a problem like image recognition and image classification or the ability to recognize speech, again, speech becomes something that it's a pattern recognition problem, interestingly enough. And what has happened over the last few years is that we have seen more improvements in the error rate and the quality of being able to solve these problems than in the last decades. The slope is getting to the point where achieving human-level performance in both of those tasks. Second point, machines that we're creating will also be capable of learning through interaction, meaning we will be able to teach them by just interacting with them. So I'm going to show you a very short video of the work of a brilliant roboticist in my team, John Connell, who has been working for the last 20 years to teach robots through interaction. Let me show this to you. Eli, grab it. Eli, grab it. I'm confused. Which of the four things do you mean? Eli, what color is the object on the left? It's blue. Eli, grab it. Eli, grab that object. Eli, grab the white thing. Do you mean this one? No, the other one. Eli, grab the green thing. Sorry, that's too big for me. Eli, what is the object on the left? I don't know. Eli, that object is aspirin. Okay, I guess it's aspirin. Eli, this object is Advil. Okay, 
That is Advil. Eli, how many Advil do you see? I see two. Eli, poke the thing in the middle. I don't know how to poke something. Eli, point at it. Eli, extend your hand. Eli, retract your hand. Eli, that is how you poke something. Okay, now I know how to poke something. Eli, poke the red object. The second trend is behind many of these aspects, specifically the statistical machine learning approaches I was alluding to in terms of pattern recognition. You need massive data sets to train. And a byproduct of the Internet, Internet of Things, and the World Wide Web is that we have massive data sets for training and for establishing the ground truths of these algorithms. And this is a fundamental shift from the activities on artificial intelligence that were happening in the 80s. These data sets simply did not exist. So as we digitize the world, we're creating the basis to do more and more effective pattern recognition. The third trend is that the cost of computing continues to improve dramatically. Um, in 2011, at IBM Research, we built a machine uh, called Watson that success successfully defeated the two best Jeopardy players. This was the machine then. It was 10 refrigerator-sized computers. This is the machine today to perform the similar task. And in a few years, you'll fit in an iPad and so on. So that's a reality that continues to manifest itself. The fourth trend associated with this area, and perhaps most telling, is that this is where some of the very best talent in the scientific and technological domain is shifting to. Um, hard to read on the table, but it's a picture of all the new startups, or many startups and companies that are making massive investments in this field of artificial intelligence. And basically, they are applying it to every sector. And you know, this, you know, in a measure of the hype also associated with this, Kevin Kelly from Wire made the statement that the business plans of the next 10,000 startups is basically take X and apply AI to it. I would comment that from the institution I work in IBM, we're making some of the largest investments in our company associated with this very trend. We launched Watson Group about a year and a half ago, and we committed a, a billion dollars to do that, and that doesn't even include the new unit we created called Watson Health. We have over 500 scientists who work full-time on cognitive computing across all these disciplines. So let me go to the second claim. My second claim is that the future of expertise will be defined by people and learning systems working collaboratively. And that this should be the proper design point. In a way, I guess the distinction I would make between cognitive computing and artificial intelligence, as classically stated, is that cognitive computing is elements of AI with a human in the loop. So I think we should be able to design systems where people and professionals we continue to carry the meaning of work and the expertise that people have, the fact that people are the ones that bring the problems that need to be solved, the fact that people bring in also their values and their common sense into the problem, but that these learning systems have an unparalleled ability to do analysis and discovery across all digital knowledge, and that we should create a relationship where there's this fluid interchange and collaboration to solve problems that neither party could solve on their own. Let me give you just one quick example of a demonstration of two researchers in the laboratory who are playing the role of analysts exploring a potential company to acquire. Oops, no sound. Let me see. Uh, hmm. Oh, here. Let's see if I can do it directly from here. Watson, I need help with acquisitions. Hello. How can I help you with mergers and acquisitions? 
Watson, show me companies with revenue between $25 million and $60 million pertaining to analytics. Let's see what I can find. I found 87 companies. Nice. Okay. So that's a good start. What that's do you think, Brian? But I was doing some homework, actually. I think we should pull on that Watson Strategy Group document. There's a lot of key concepts in there. Let's feed it to Watson. All right. Watson, please regard this as cognitive strategy. Watson, show me companies with revenue between $15 million and $60 million pertaining to cognitive strategy. Let's see what I can find. Yeah, this is nice. I found 112 mm. companies. Now we're getting a lot in here. And we can see we're, we're getting some connections too, I think. Watson, show me companies that are about analytics and cognitive strategy that are most similar to the companies named Wolfram Alpha and Kawasaki Robotics. I found three companies huh? similar to the oh. ones you specified. Beautiful. Well, let's see what we think of these. Dive a little deeper. Let's compare these things. Sure. Watson, show me a decision table. Here is a decision table that will enable you to compare companies side by side. Watson, place the companies named Wolfram Alpha and Kawasaki Robotics and Cognolytics and Raytheon BBN Technologies and Decisive Analytics in the decision table. OK. Nice. OK, but I think we need a little more than that. We need some uh, other attributes. Watson, place the attributes named revenue and employees and corporate structure in the decision table. OK. All right, so now uh, we've got this side-by-side -side comparison. What do you think? Yeah, I think uh, that's right. Watson, give me a suggestion. I have a suggestion. I'll stop there to, again, not name companies. Um, so let me um, close that, you know, from just a pure technology view, I look at the advancements that are happening in artificial intelligence and cognitive computing in the long context of creating technologies to enhance human ability. And in the same way, we overcome physical limitations or desire to connect with one another as social beings. This will help us deal with more cognitively complex tasks that we could deal before. Um, but I would emphasize, and that's why I'm looking forward very much to the discussion, that the design point around this should be around continuing to put human and human agency and the work that people carry out at the very center of that. And I think there are both policy and you know, technological choices that can be made to be able to carry uh, that vision out.